just gonna do directly from Canva. So we'll see how, how this goes. Cool. Oh, it's so fancy. But that's not the next slide, right? Oh, maybe it is. No, it is. Okay. I was like, I looked at these. It's I wasn't expecting it to be so fancy, but all right, here we go. Let's start. So today we're mostly going to work on um, talking about methods and some considerations for methods um, and what you should think about when writing the proposal. And then I'm happy to answer questions specific to your ideas. So the agenda is mostly going to be like methods considerations. And I tried to structure this like our normal APA, um, but some of the things overlap. So like materials and procedures sometimes are really hard to disentangle. Um, so we kind of stuck things as best we could in each spot. And then thinking about how one can scale up a normal size project to a large scale project, and then times for uh, questions and brainstorming like normal. So method considerations. First step, what is required in the proposal? So you should talk about the sample characteristics. What types of people are you expecting to recruit? and inclusion and exclusion. We'll get into each of these a little bit more. Talk about the materials. This is something that you can add directly into the supplement to show folks like these are the things we're planning on using. Uh, the procedure and separate from inclusion exclusion rules for participants, right? This might be like who can even take the study, but thinking about like what happens if, if it crashes? right? Or like, what happens if the whole survey blows up? What would, how, what kind of data would I exclude? Obviously, you might not think of everything. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, right? But having some ideas on um, what makes the study data good would be helpful. And then sufficient detail to allow other people to replicate. Obviously, we don't know what other people's questions are going to be, but this should be where the bulk of the writing is in the proposal. And then we're heavily suggesting people use open source platforms. We're really trying to push towards making everything open source. And so I'll give you some examples uh, here at the end. All right, so for participants, who do you want to sample, right? So what sample kind of sample successfully answers your research question? Is it okay that they're convenient samples? Because I would argue that most of the labs that would be happy to participate in any study are going to be college student kind of convenient samples. If that's not what you're looking for, that's okay. But um, you would need to say that kind of clearly. Right? Do you need a matched or diverse sample? So some folks are wanting samples that are at least matched to the demographics of the country. Right? And that might be a little harder for some regions. So when I ironically have on my Missouri State shirt today, so when I was in Missouri, uh, finding non-white participants would have been very hard for me. Okay. Um, so that might limit the labs that can participate. Or do you need special populations? So we've talked about special populations a couple of times. Again, they're not a deal breaker, um, but clarifying like what the requirements are for inclusion here. Okay. Now, how many participants you need? So we actually dedicated a whole week to power and kind of giving you some some tips on power simulations because it, it really, the types of designs that um, you'll end up doing, you'll probably need to, to uh, simulate it. Uh, but I have like a whole week for that. And we left some open space at the end for folks to get help with their specific ideas. Um, but one thing I, I thought it was on this slide, maybe it's on the next slide. Yes, okay, I'll hold my thought there. But so how many participants do you need? Um, and you can think about like how many would be good for one lab, right? And so think like, okay, if I, I know that I need, that in a normal study, I would collect 50, that's not a bad starting point for each lab. We tend not to try to go over that number too much because that limits the labs that can, that can feasibly participate. Um, so studies that require more then 50 as a minimum, it does tend to diminish who you can get to join. And we'd rather be more inclusive um, than less. 
And so if you think about it kind of that way, like I might need a hundred labs who each get 50 people. Okay. And then how many geopolitical regions, which is the fancy word for country, but being more inclusive since there are several places that are sort of contested <laughs> in the world, but um, thinking about how many regions or languages you need to recruit. If you're not studying language, uh, for me, that was focusing on the language. But if you're focusing more on, I want a diverse sample from different countries, you could also think about like, okay, if I want German, I can get that from Austria and Germany and some other places, but the big two. So I really only need 10 labs from that area, but it could be either country. So you can kind of focus on talking about how many languages you're interested in recruiting in because language and culture are very closely tied. Um, or you can talk about it from the country perspective, right? So what, what kind of sample? Do you want 10 countries that are at least 10 different languages or do you want 15 languages? So it kind of depends on the question. For example, um, 009 is about to start and it's a focusing, a focusing on the gender of the leader uh, in different little written scenarios. But one thing that they're interested in is languages that have gender markers versus languages that don't. So they're more focused on the language component of it and how many people they need in each language versus the country component of it. Okay. Uh, other studies uh, like, I know the second JTF is focused on the countries. So they're wanting at least 50 different countries. So it'll kind of depend. Um, but you, that's one way you might think about like how many of those do I want? And that also help you answer, the, do some of the work for power. And it doesn't have to be crazy. You'll see some numbers here in a little bit that look crazy. Um, but I would say the average number of countries that people get is about 20. Right? So if you have no idea, you could say, well, the normal average is 20. So we're going to shoot for that. Right? Now, the thing I was thinking about a minute ago, um, is a sort of a lesson learned about specific sampling. So in honor of exclusion, we would like labs to be able to join. Uh, and if you have specific inclusion rules, maybe is there a way that you can pre-screen for those? So what uh, the stereotype threat study did was they were only looking for black participants. So they had some, they specifically recruited them or had some pre-screening. But if they were, if they came into the lab and they turned out that they weren't the right person, they still were allowed to take it, right? Um, and then there's some exclusion rules on other studies. But for example, in my own situation, I have plenty of students that I can have take the study, but they're usually not American. And so if we're wanting um, students who are of the nationality of the country they're in, like that would exclude me. And I, I can't just give my study to two of my students. So having avenues, like I have this exclusion rule, but it's okay if labs collect data from other people, but this is how we'll, ex we'll find out in the data and exclude those people. So um, that's sort of a lesson learned. Like we don't want to exclude labs that might have enough data, but they can't, I'm like, I was like, I can't only give half my students extra credit. That doesn't make any sense. So allow the exclusion to happen on the data end and not necessarily on the um, lab end, because that would be a more inclusive procedure, but making it clear like, hey, and they did make it clear in the collaboration agreement. I just, you know, didn't read that part. So it's on me. But I think um, allowing labs that could collect that sample to collect it where you have some of what you want, some of not what you want, but exclude it on the later end. That doesn't hurt people, right? Um, so determining what you need for the analysis, right? So power, often we think about how many participants we need for X effect size given X analysis. But then also remember uh, completion rates. So um, do people normally finish the study? Or is this one of those studies where they can't actually get the answers right? And we have to include that sort of um, account in our data. Right? So uh, when you do like a priming study, for example, people will drop out because it's very boring. It's super duper 
like mind-numbingly boring. And so we had like, we looked at previous data and said, well, we expect this many people to just quit or they can't get the answers right enough for us to include their data. Um, so anytime you, you do power, you should also probably estimate like how many people do you expect to exclude due to inattention, non-completion or outliers. And your best guess, like I always tell folks, I'll say this again on the week for power. I always tell people that all power analyses are wrong, but they're at least hopefully useful. Kind of following on that all models are wrong, but some models are useful because they really represent just our best guess at what might happen. And something's gonna be wrong in there. So just thinking about that um, and adding a couple sentences on what you might expect to me implies that you have a good feel for like, people might drop out or people might not pay enough attention. And here's how we're gonna control for that. Uh, because we definitely have gotten ourselves in trouble with the data quality problems before, but it was kind of, it kind of happened during COVID issues. Um, so thinking about what makes quality data should be included somewhere in here, right? So inclusion and exclusion criteria might be more like, I only wanna study, you know, 18 to 30 year olds for whatever reason. But this is more about like what makes those people's data useful. Like what is, what is it that actually I can analyze? Okay, so there's kind of two points here on inclusion and exclusion. <clears throat> All right, in the materials, stick them in the supplement. Can't hurt you. That would be my suggestion. If they're like specific materials, like a specific scale, or um, a specific task, like if you want to use the waste and task, for example, um, then you can just cite those materials. But I think when it comes to reviewers, I'm going to have a much easier time reviewing and understanding what you're doing if I can see the materials. Because the um, even if it's like a scale that you know you shouldn't reproduce, right? You could stick. This is not going to be post it publicly. So you can stick it in there for review. Okay. Now on the materials, we have some lesson learned and those in the next couple of slides. Okay. So cultural lessons learned. This is, Savannah compiled a lot of this and it's um, really great, but thinking about how other areas of the world may interpret your study. Uh, priming, it turns out is super boring everywhere. <laughs> But um, other, like the trolley problem, I was involved in that one. So I wish I knew more about um, what the moral components issues they had. Uh, but I can imagine that asking morality level questions or spiritual, uh, spirit, spiritual questions, spirituality, where is that? Where's that word, that accent go? Um, religiosity, I can say that one. Um, that is gonna be very different across the globe. And so uh, one of the ones that I've been helping with, they've been trying to figure out the best way to ask that question that is culturally sensitive to like all kinds of, of religions. So um, mm -hmm. thinking about that kind of question, right? being mindful of demographic questions. There are some demographic questions that you can't ask without a lot of review. Like you can ask them, but it's a, you're gonna, it's going to take a lot longer to go through ethics and be a lot more troublesome. Um, so this is usually in Europe uh, based on their interpretation of GDPR. So again, I love picking on France because theirs is probably one of the most strict interpretations of GDPR. Um, where asking about race, ethnicity, religion, gender slash sex is very no, no. Okay. So if your hypothesis depends on that facet, then you might consider that that will, that might limit or make it harder for some places. Not that you shouldn't still continue with what you're doing, but again, you might say, well, here's how we might change this for these countries. Or, you know, we know this might be a problem and we'll take uh, the PSA's expertise on this. And then being mindful of things that are hot topics, like anytime you talk about um, drugs and alcohol, politics, um, and then abortion is a big one. 
suicide, obviously that these are kind of globally hot button topics, any deception that's used. Okay, so we have had studies with deception. It's not been a big deception though. So the stereotype threat study, I think in one of the conditions, it tells them that this, the Raven's progressive matrices um, test their IQ, okay, which doesn't really do, but they're trying to promote that, that threat. Okay, so we have done some deception, but not a ton. And substances, I'm assuming you mean drugs and alcohol, right? So, okay, yeah. Asking people about their drug use is always a, a touchy subject. Right? <laughs> so anything that might cause social desirability bias might also be one that is harder to push through certain countries. <clears throat> All right, and then some other lessons learned. Translations are tricky, right? So don't be super attached to any question or specific wording of a question because it will likely, what the translators will do is try to keep the same semantic meaning. So this, this culturally, this should mean the same thing as what you put it through in probably English. Um, but, you know, a direct translation might tell you that the words are different. So we really push towards trying to like have them represent the same concepts with the warning that that may affect the scale reliability or um, the structure of the scale. And so I think that paper from data and methods is out, right? I think so we can find that paper. Um, so data and methods did a, a analysis of all the different languages for one of the studies. Now I can't remember which one, one of the scales that they used to, you know, see how well our translation procedures worked. So you can kind of look at that. <clears throat> but we'll say that the, the goal is to keep the connotations the same, um, but with the warning that it may or may not be perfect. <clears throat> I think that's another interesting, like kind of secondary paper, but I also like that stuff. So, um, you know, if you're, if I would say, try to avoid one question scales if you can, because then you're going to have, you know, all the reliance on one item. So if you have like a five item scale, hopefully across all of those, you'll get the same latent construct. Right? <clears throat> all right. Will you watch the chat for me, Savannah? I saw it pop up, but I don't know. Yeah. I didn't want to put it on the screen to record, but <clears throat> Uh, I left in this because it made me laugh, um, but Savannah says it's all in the deets, uh, meaning it's all in the details. Right? <clears throat> all right. When you get into your procedure, we want to know as many details as you can. So when I submitted mine, I actually had a little tiny demo of it, not the whole full thing, because I think reviewers would have rejected how boring it was, but I had just like a, like a consent form is going to go here. And then here's the demographic questions we want to ask. And then here's, you know, 10 priming trials, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so if you have it built in Qualtrics, you can include a link. Uh, or if you have it, have all the questionnaires, throw those into the supplement. So the supplement is there to help really make what your procedure is clear. I personally think it's going to be much easier for review. You're going to get less questions of, I don't understand what you're doing. If you have a little demo of it. Okay. Um, some things are not complicated, like surveys, surveys on these concepts, not complicated, but if you have like I want to do this and this and this. It might just be easier if you had a demonstration of the of the study. Okay. I wouldn't say go totally crazy. Like I'm not expecting folks to spend all of their time programming this big complicated study. But if you had like a tiny demo of it, you know, that will help reviewers from the network and from outside to understand what you're doing. Because if I think about the reviews that we've seen in the past, most of them are around the materials and method. Right, um, and less so on the theory and concepts. <clears throat> now, there are some cool studies that people have proposed, and so I can talk about JTF too. 
um, where they propose like, hey, we wanna give people this scale and test the structure of this scale across cultures, but we don't exactly know what the items are gonna be because what they did was they designed new items and then tested them on a like a pilot sample of the collaborators. And I think that's kind of, that's cool, right? So you may use reviewer feedback or experts, like it might be part of your design to have experts suggest interventions and then put those interventions into place. And that's allowable. So you can propose things that aren't fully set, but explain how you're gonna establish that. Like we're gonna ask 50 experts to suggest these interventions. We're gonna take the top five most popular ones and then we'll implement those. And here's some examples of what we expect they're gonna say. Okay. So how will you, you know, resolve the question of which ones you're gonna pick? So, um, Although I think Lucy has changed her mind, like changed her mind like five or 10 times, but you know, we got feedback. It was clear that um, people didn't understand one of the sets of items, like they didn't like them. And so we, we as a team ended up discussing back and forth, like what, what items are we going to pick and what should we do with this and how do we fix it? Uh, so, you know, nothing's perfect, but they put in their paper, like, we will ask experts to find these items, but here are some examples of previous items. And I think that's, I think that's cool because you're using, uh, you know, kind of the global collective to come up with things that you might not have thought of. All right, now ethics review. So some lessons learned from different ethics situations. I think we've talked about this once before, but Repetition doesn't hurt. So generally there are three types of ethics or IRB situations for labs. They could have no ethics. Uh, so there are countries where there is no ethics board in the least. Um, and we have those labs just generally submit a letter from their institution or their place that we don't do ethics review. Okay. As somebody who has federal laws for ethics, I found that weird, but it's a thing. Uh, a lot of places can rely on the main author's ethics. So they say, since it's already been approved here, we'll allow you to collect data at our institution because you already have approval. I would say the middle one is probably the most common. And then um, there are places that say, nope, you have to have our own ethics review. And so they'll have to do their own. Okay. Um, and so we generally tell teams and help them put together these like ethics packets that we give. And if you've been involved in one of our studies, you've seen this probably, or like, here's the packet of that we submitted. And um, you, I will say you spend a lot of time answering questions from other people's IRBs. Okay. Well, the most common question is where's is the data stored and who has access to it? Okay, that's not something you have to put in your proposal. Right, but I'm just kind of mentioning this. This is the most common thing that I, I feel like we got asked. Are there other things? So I know I'm trying to think. So where's the data stored and who has access to it is probably one of the biggest ones. And so uh, one thing that Data Methods is doing is putting together um, data management plans that we could probably put with the ethics document to help solve some of those. Um, and some ethics are quite slow. So depending on the time that all, you know, you kind of get through the process. Uh, some labs may not have a board convening for months. So we, we have done different, totally ethical things <laughs> to add people to different IRBs to make it possible, right? So in some places it was easier to add the researcher to my IRB <laughs> who was like, cool, another person, they got city training, sweet. Uh, and then allow them to to do the work at their own institution than it would be to wait on their institution to give approval. So we, we have help and the ethics committee has discussed a lot of these scenarios and has ways to kind of help deal with all of them. Ah, last part. <clears throat> so we're suggesting that folks use open source methods. Um, and we're really trying to move this way with newer projects. And what that means is that people can repeat our methods. So by having the methodology be implemented in an open source way, it's easier, depends on what it is, right? To pick it up and have somebody else replicate it. 
or use it again, like mix and rematch, right? Um, obviously not all open source things are necessarily easy to use, but there are also things that you wouldn't know until you hit the, the roadblock. So Qualtrics, which is arguably the most popular survey software, actually does ban certain countries from accessing their surveys. Okay. And that obviously is paid a paid thing. So not everyone has access to it. Uh, if I can remember the country bans, I know it's Iran, Cuba, North Korea, and a couple more. Surprisingly, it's a U.S. company, but surprisingly not Russia and China, even though the U.S. currently has sanctions on those countries. Um, but it does limit what people who can participate. And that may not matter in your study, but we're trying to be our best to be as open and inclusive as possible. Okay. The other thing you have to be careful with is Google products. So there are bans on, on Google in general in several countries. Uh, China's the big one. Um, and, you know, some access um, limitations. And uh, unfortunately, like as part of the PSA, we use a Google Drive for a lot of stuff. Uh, because it's really like honestly one of the best solutions. So I just warn people about being careful with Google products in general. Um, but it, obviously no, no solution is perfect. So let me give you some suggestions. So if you're interested in doing surveys, there's Form R. Um, and Savannah and I both have done a ton of Form R. Uh, and can help. So we have people who've done a little bit of each of these. So uh, one of the new things that we're going to try is adding implementation people to the admin team to just basically help you, you know, make this work, right? Like, how can I make it run, right? Uh, Lime survey is a nice free open source one and SOSI survey, which is run by, I can't remember who this is run by, but we've used it for a couple of them and it works pretty well. If you're interested in things that require specific timing and response latencies, so there's PsychJS, LabJS, which I've used before, and PsychoPy. So there are options that are open source for pretty much anything you want to do. And if you aren't super comfortable with it, you could say, here I've programmed it in my way that I'm comfortable with, but I would be happy to have expertise to make it open source. Okay, So you won't get dinged if in the methods you're like, here's an example of it in Qualtrics. right? But this is sort of a warning that we're warning folks to move towards um, towards using open implementations. So we might make you uncomfortable by making you do it open source once you get accepted. Okay. But there is help. All right. And then some just general method-y kind of thoughts. So can you run the study? And I use the quotes here online. Okay. If you want to do an in-person study, we'd love to see more of those. But keeping that nice balance of, of localization, I think is what I call it somewhere else, and standardization. Right? So we've got to we've got to make local context. So we've already talked about that in the sense of translation and some things aren't going to be allowed, et cetera. But can we balance the local context with as much standardization as possible? So if the results are a mess, we can say, well, we did our best to balance these two things. And so what, for example, um, um, our object orientation study, which was a second study in the second iteration, like sort of COVID break, and then the second iteration, we had the study online. Now they still had to come into the lab to do it, but everyone was using the same study link and keeping the data in the same place. Okay? And then the um, stereotype threat study, everybody got uh, the same link, so it kept the data in the same place. So at least we knew the study implementation was the same. Now the researcher experience in the lab, right, is going to be different because they're different teaching assistants, et cetera. Um, but keeping that the data in one place with all the same variable names is super wonderful for lots of reasons that so we could go on and on about. <laughs> um, so can you run the study online? And I don't mean online, online. Uh, and then there are other times where you may say, no, I want to go out into the field and do, and you know, collect people that wouldn't have access to online. Okay. Well, how are you going to standardize that? Well, we'll have these paper surveys and everybody has the same ones. 
for example. Okay. And then will there be special computer requirements? Um, you know, like do, do the labs need something special to do the study? Okay. And if so, what is that? And can we help train people how to do that? So um, before the online version of the object orientation study, they had to install the software themselves and that caused a lot of hiccups. So converting it to like sort of managed online version solved a lot of problems. <clears throat> so how can we keep a good balance between um, local context and overall standardization? <clears throat> and then how long should your study be, right? So how much, Time and effort is required by both the participants and the collaborators, right? I will tell you, people like studies that are easier to run, right, for obvious reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean that they won't join a project that is a little bit harder to run. But we generally keep studies to about 30 minutes or less. It's not a hard requirement um, because for convenience samples, people just need to know, like, how much credit am I giving them or how much some places pay, how much am I paying them? So. There, this just seems to be a common trend, like right at that 30 minute mark or less. Okay. Some studies have been longer. I, I want to say the stereotype threat one is probably longer. It's definitely got to be longer because of the Ravens. Yeah, it's, it's 60 minutes. An hour. But we just, you right up front told folks this one takes an hour. So give whatever equivalent credit that means for your area. Right. But I would say in general, most of them hit this 30 minute or less mark. Thinking about the feasibility of lab participant recruitment, right? So can the labs recruit the types of participants you're looking for? Okay. And then making sure everybody has access to the materials or the links. Okay. Double check your links are open. If you're gonna put supplemental like documents somewhere else, please make sure the OSF is available. This is from the editor in me who spends a lot of time emailing people like, I'm so happy you put stuff on OSF. Can you make it where we can see it? Thanks. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, and you may not know when it comes to like participant recruitment, if you have questions about that, like, here's what I want to do. Do you think labs could recruit? Certainly this is a question that I think we can find the answer to, right? <clears throat> and I might say, well, you should also consider this, right? All right. So scaling up kind of our last part. So thinking about how do I go from a study where I normally run, you know, 50 to 200 people to, you know, 10,000 people. All right. So think bigger. Um, so some of the incubation proposals that we've seen so far and or the, the kind of ideas people toss around, it's like, great, but much larger. Right. So we do have people all the way across the globe and each project definitely brings in new folks because they have, you know, it's a different field, a different interest. Um, so shoot big, right? If you told me you only wanted 10 labs and be like, well, why are you asking for my help? Okay. If you want hundred labs, that's more normal. Okay. So I, I think until I got into this, this sounded totally bonkers to me. Like you want me to what? Like you want how many participants? But, um, we want to see folks who are really interested in using, you know, the resources that we have. So think bigger. And um, here's some averages for you. So projects have had, uh, on average, studies in approximately 20 languages with approximately 20 regions. And I actually uh, have this wonderful slide that I was able to present a little while ago um, that kind of has a review of the first seven. Obviously, we have eight and nine is now coming out uh, and three JTF studies, but they're all kind of early-ish in their stages. So this is kind of a summary of everything so far um, of the number of authors and then the number of countries and languages to kind of give you a feel for like what we can accomplish. I will say that two and three here were happening during COVID. I think they could have gotten more people, but that definitely was a, was a lot of COVID issues. Uh, five here has a very specific population. So black American college students much smaller. So that's why those are, I think, our smaller numbers. And I will say one of the biggest things that we're going to see in the future is that our success will also be a hindrance in the sense that they know what we can do. And so if you're submitting a registered report, you're going to be asked to do 
something of the same size. So I suggested that we should have, I think, five languages, which is totally unheard of for priming study. And they came back and they're like, LOL, you should do 10 because we know you can do it. Um, and 30 is how many we had in total. I think we completed it either 18 or 19. I wrote this thing. I should know. But, um, you know, they wanted way more. I was trying to undersell, uh, under, under promise so we could over deliver. <laughs> and they made me, made me push higher. So, you know, one of our normal publication routes is nature, human behavior, and they are very kind to us, but they also expect a lot from us. So just FYI. Um, and I was going to say that uh, when you mentioned like O2 and O3 being in COVID, the problem with that is that they were in person also during in COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that is what we mean, because like the CR projects are the COVID rapid projects and they were also during COVID, but online. Mm -hmm. um, so like you can see that we got a lot higher of numbers of participants um, and that so. And we had some people who donated several paid samples. Mm -hmm. That one too. But M and O seven, there were some folks who paid for samples. So that is becoming um, more, sort of more of an option where folks are willing to say, "I don't really want to do the work, but I'll pay, give you some of my money." So that that's happened a couple times, <clears throat> which is a good thing. Don't mind the money, right? And then some other things to consider. So management, right? So I, you know you're gonna have a ton of variability in, in different places, in the, the language component, in potentially, depending on how well we can standardize the, the methods. And so trying to keep those uh, confounding variables to a minimum, there, no one, again, nothing is perfect, but um, we've had, it used to be a rule that we had people make videos of their procedure. And then we kind of dropped the rule because we were doing so many online studies. Like I remember I made one and I felt really stupid. Like, <laughs> okay, people are going to sign up on our system and then they're going to click the link and then they're going to click the study. Like I felt silly because like I wasn't involved at all. Um, but if you're going to do anything in person, having labs have these training videos could be a really useful source of like secondary data, um, but standardized scripts for in-person data collection or um, sort of any kind of like, here's what the procedure should look like from your end. Okay. Um, because what will generally happen is we'll get specific study links um, for each lab. So you can, you'll know where each data point came from. So thinking about what might might mess up your results. And then data management. Now, you will get a person to help with data management if you want help. Um, but in general, we're going to suggest that you store the data in one place, if possible. So uh, while Crepe uh, loves to do the training for people, so the collaborative replication education in psychology, can I remember what all the letters for CREPE stand for? Collaborative education or collaborative replication and education project. Project. Okay. So CREPE, really cool partner um, partner group, uh, focuses more on pedagogy, having the students make the surveys. On our end, we focus more on standardization because it makes it much easier to analyze the data. So having um, you know one survey data collection point or at least you must give it this way. <laughs> and here the variable names are all the same. I promise your life will be easier at the end because you're not trying to combine data from various sources that don't match anymore. Okay. Um, you'd rather have the data not match because the word for um, associate's degree is different in every country and some countries don't have that. Like, okay, so I have it in this country's data but I don't have it in that country's data but at least it's all in one silly place, okay? Um, and so that's just a practical issue. And then the other thing that we've done um, that I've, I've mostly written for a lot of folks is keeping track of the participants. So thinking about like, can I have a specific participant code in my study that allows participants to ask for their data to be deleted? Because some countries do require this or at least a warning, like you can't. 
and allows research labs to give people credit for taking part in their study. And it also allows the labs to keep track of how many they've collected. Okay, so by removing their ability to have the data in their own lab, we then give them back the ability to make sure they can track everything they, that they're doing. Um, because I, you answer a lot less emails when uh, they can look up their answers on their own. Okay. Um, and that's, a lot of people have really liked that. Uh, it also is kind of fun to watch how well, how the study's going, right? So most of our projects now have shiny apps that allow you to track data collection, right? And that's something, again, you don't have to know how to do, can help you do that. But thinking about like, there's gonna be a participant code somewhere for, for tracking purposes. Okay. All right. There are no dumb questions, I promise. Please ask everything and anything. And then I was told that not to forget to show this slide <laughs> at the end. So um, all of these links are on in the call for studies. They're on the OSF page. Uh, and you can email, so this comes to Savannah and I both, uh, questions about your specific ideas. So I didn't forget, Savannah. Okay, so now we'll stop the recording and let you guys ask as many questions as you would like. I'm sorry I went on and on forever. <laughs>